Welcome to Cutting It Straight with Pastor H.B. Charles Jr., author and pastor teacher at Shiloh Church in Jacksonville and Orange Park, Florida. Our prayer is that today's broadcast will bless and enrich your life. For more resources, go to www.hbcharlesjr.com. That's hbcharlesjr.com. And now, here's Pastor H.B. Charles Jr. Good day and thank you for watching Cutting It Straight. My name is H.B. Charles Jr. and we're glad that you're joining us for this new broadcast of services emanating from the Shiloh Church in Jacksonville, Florida, where I'm privileged to serve. We hope that you'll be blessed by the ministry of the Word and for more information about my teachings or the ministry of Shiloh Church, you can go to hbcharlesjr.com. For now, join us as we study God's Word together. I want to label the message today simply warfare prayer. Warfare prayer. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 20 is the fullest statement about spiritual warfare in the New Testament. This passage on spiritual warfare does not focus on the work of the enemy as much as it focuses on the life of the believer. This passage essentially calls upon you and me as followers of Jesus Christ to be and become strong Christians. Verse 10 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. To be a strong Christian requires two things. On one hand, be a strong Christian, you need divine equipment. Verse 11 of the passage says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Strong Christians are dressed for battle. You must put on the whole armor of God. This armor mentioned in verse 11 and verse 13, is listed for us in verses 14 through 17. We're to put on or take up the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. To be a strong Christian, you need divine equipment. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20 is one of the characteristically long passages in this letter. In verse 17, Paul has not finished his thought when he finishes listing the whole armor. He concludes the text in verses 18 through 20 by calling us to practice warfare prayer, which teaches us. That to be a strong Christian, you need not only divine equipment, you need divine energy. You cannot be strong in your own strength. You can only be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And that strength is accessed through prayer. In fact, the bottom line of Ephesians 6, verses 18 through 20 is simply this. Strong Christians fight on their knees. Paul wrote this letter while under house arrest in Rome where he is chained to a Roman soldier. It is most likely this Roman soldier that the Holy Spirit uses to prompt Paul to draw this picture of the Christian warrior. He sees the soldier to which he has chained has on a belt, and he says the Christian has a belt. It is true. 
The Roman soldier has a breastplate. The Christian soldier has a breastplate. It is righteousness. The Roman soldier has a shield. The Christian soldier, Paul says, has a shield. It is faith. And on and on and goes. But in verse 18, Paul continues to discuss the warfare even though he drops the metaphor. He does so, I believe, because prayer is the believer's secret weapon. There was nothing the Roman soldier had that can correspond to what the Christian has in prayer. Uh, in the heat of a battle, the Roman soldier could not call on Lord Caesar for help in the midst of the fight. But the Christian soldier, in the midst of the battle, can call on the Lord Jesus Christ to help you stand your ground in the heat of the battle. The the. The privilege of prayer is the believer's secret weapon. The Christian becomes a strong Christian by fighting on his knees. If you are to stand in power, you got to first learn how to kneel in prayer. To, to, to be a strong Christian happens after prayer. Restraining prayer, we cease to fight. Prayer keeps the Christian's armor bright, and Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Strong Christians fight on their knees. When I was coming up in the church I grew up in, there was a Wednesday night prayer band, and later there was a 6 a.m. Weekday morning prayer band, small group who would gather to cover the pastor, cover the church, and cover other spiritual matters in prayer. And that small group became known around the church as the prayer warriors. The prayer warriors of the church. But as you study Ephesians 6, verses 18 through 20, Paul makes it clear that Prayer warriors are not elite members of the Christian army. Every Christian is to be a prayer warrior. We're all called to be strong Christians, and strong Christians must learn how to fight on their knees. Every Christian is to be a prayer warrior. And in these verses, I want to lift three characteristics of the prayer warrior. First, Paul teaches that prayer warriors cover everything in prayer. Prayer warriors cover everything in prayer. In verses 14 through 17, Paul lists the whole armor of God. In verse 18, he drops the metaphor but continues the theme by saying that you put on this whole armor, says verse 18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, you're to keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. The connection between our text and the previous verses is that you must make sure that prayer is working in conjunction with the whole armor of God. It is by prayer that you wear the armor. In fact, I suggest that every morning you start your day by prayerfully putting on each piece of the armor one by one. But not only do you need prayer to wear the armor, you also need prayer to work the armor. On the evil day when Satan and his forces strike back against your 
faith in Christ, your love for Christ, and your devotion to Christ. It is prayer that enables you to effectively use the armor of God to stand your ground. This is why in mentioning prayer, he is saying that, that prayer cannot be some limited matter in the believer's life. Prayer cannot be some occasional matter in the Christian's life. Prayer cannot be some half-hearted matter in the believer's life. But the true prayer warrior is to cover everything in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. The rest of that verse says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. That needless pain is a part of my personal theology. I, I live by that principle of needless pains. I'm grown up enough to accept that some pain in life is necessary and inevitable, but if I ain't got to go through the pain, I don't want to go through it. Oh, what needless pains we bear, all because we do not carry, not some things, not certain things, not special things, not specific things, not even spiritual things, but everything to God in prayer. Warfare prayer is comprehensive prayer. You're to cover everything in your life. In prayer. I think the text secondly teaches us that prayer warriors not only cover everything in prayer, but secondly, prayer warriors intercede for others. A turning point in my spiritual journey was that a young, as a young man, young pastor, 20 years old, I was heading into a meeting. And I just was so anxious that I, I, I planned to sleep the whole day and just show up for the meeting, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> oh. And, and uh, I couldn't sleep. Just as the morning went, I grew more anxious to the point where that day I, I had it, I don't know technicalities, but the closest I would ever say I was to just a full-fledged panic attack. I was just frightened about what that meeting was going to bring that night. I was dealing with hardcore church fighting folk. And I didn't know what was going to happen on the other side of that meeting. And something said, you, you, need, you need prayer. And I got the phone, and I just called back. I star 69, the, the last person that called me. Those of y'all giggling, showing how old you are. <laughs> That's all you doing. <laughs> um, and it was a young adult from the church. I, don't, I didn't know what that person wanted when they called me, but I, 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 I just called and and, and never learned what they wanted. I called and, and asked for prayer. And I was moved that this person who I had never prayed with before was covering me in prayer. But as that person prayed, the voice was saying, uh-uh, that's not what I'm talking about. You need to pray. And that day, God cornered me, if you will, and forced me to wrestle with my soul's issues before him in prayer. In fact, I, I, I had to keep praying until I, my heart that day got to a place where I was able to say to the Lord, I'll praise you no matter what happens tonight. I'm, I'm going slow here because I'm trying not to tell the whole story. But I just want to throw this in. When I just got my own personal breakthrough, I showed up to the meeting late and left the meeting early, and God took care of it while I was in the bed, already asleep. Yes, he did. <laughs> but I learned that day that you can't be a strong Christian 
until you learn how to pray for yourself. Thank God for pastors and prayer partners and Sunday school teachers and ministry leaders. Thank God for mama and big mama that's praying for you. Thank God for family and friends and that person you can call on in the jam. But if you are going to be a strong Christian, you got to learn how to get to the place in your life where, where you are able to say, as they used to say, it's not my father, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You cannot be a strong Christian until you learn how to pray for yourself. But let me add on top of that as Paul moves the text forward, that you cannot be a strong Christian if you only pray for yourself. The Bible teaches us that we should not just pray for ourselves, we should pray for other people. Like who? Romans 10 says you should pray for the lost that they would be saved. 1 Timothy 2 says you should pray for governmental leaders, for those who are in authority over you in the government that you may live a quiet and peaceable life. Matthew 5, Jesus says you ought to pray for those that spitefully use you and mistreat you. But here in Ephesians 6, Paul says you also need to learn how to pray for the saints. In the prayer of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, verse 18 talks about love among the saints. The word here, saints, is not elite, holy Christians. Everyone who is in Christ is set apart for the purposes of God. Every Christian is a saint. And the Bible says that to be a Christian is not just to have faith in Jesus, but love for all the saints. And now he tells us one way to show your love for the saints is to pray for the saints. And not just the saints that you are cool with. But to pray for all the saints. How do you pray for all the saints? Let me give a principle and a practice. Here's the principle. Just meditating on this, I, I want to suggest to you, church, that intercessory prayer must be intentional prayer. There are important things in life that you'll never do, that we'll never get to, if we don't have an intentional plan and path to do that. And I want to suggest that a good principle for being more committed to praying for others is to have an intentional strategy for doing that. And by that, I simply mean you need a prayer list that includes more than just the issues in your life. You need a prayer list that includes other people that you are committed to praying for. Oh, I got quiet up in this house. How do you practice that? I think you ought to have a prayer list of others that you are praying for, and, and this ought to include three categories. Names, needs, and nations. You ought to have a list of people that you know other Christians that you are praying for by name, you are bringing their names before the Lord in prayer. That when you are praying, these names and these persons and these families are coming to your heart and mind because you have made a regular commitment to pray for them by name. And if you are part of a church, listen to me, and you don't have any connection with other Christians so that there's a list of names you know in the church you are part of to pray for, you're doing church wrong. You ought to be praying for names, and then not only names, you need to be praying for needs. In a church this size, you won't know all the names, but you can be praying for the other members of the saints by need. Pray for the, pick a day to pray for the sick. Pick a day to pray for married people in the church. Pick a day to pray for single people in the church. Pick a day to pray for those who are unemployed and underemployed. Y'all ain't in here with me. Pick a day to pray for the youth of our church. Pray for those that are grieving. 
in the church. Pray by name. Pray by need. And then pray for the nations. That's the great commission. Jesus didn't say, go and make disciples of your neighborhood. Are y'all in here with me? He, he said, you need to make disciples of all the nations. Are, are y'all at least watching the news and seeing all that's going on around the world? The nations need the church to rise up in prayer. No political leader is going to fix the problems of the world. Only the gospel can do that. No economic level can fix the problems of the world. Only the gospel can do that. Not education can fix the problems of the world. Only the gospel can do that. And we've got to pray that the gospel will get out to the nations. My first trip to Memphis, I, I made a pilgrimage to years ago. to Bellevue Baptist Church, where one of my preaching heroes, Adrian Rogers, was then the pastor. I saw many things that encouraged my faith that day, but one of them was a long hallway full of flags. I asked the guide what these flags represented, and the guide said that these flags represented nations where the church had members that were serving as missionaries spreading the gospel, and the flags were there so that as members walked down the hall, it would be a reminder to pray for those nations where the gospel was being preached so that souls around the world would be saved. Which forced me to ask an obvious question. Half of these flags are black flags. What does that represent? God said, those black flags represent nations where it is officially illegal to preach the gospel. And to make sure we don't put those families in danger, we don't put those flags up, we just put a black flag there to remind us to pray for them that are in difficult places trying to get the good news of Jesus out. Are y'all in here with me? Pray for all the saints, but then notice the, the beginning of verse 19. Paul moves from the general to the specific, and he says, don't just pray for all the saints. I love this. Pray for me. Paul says, pray for me, which is a reminder to pray for your spiritual leaders. Your spiritual leaders, church, need your prayer. I think we see a hint here at the schemes of the devil. Too often, church, we are, we are quick to pray for those who are obviously weak, but slow to pray for those that are apparently strong. And then you watch strong people fall, and you say, how in the world did that happen? Christian leaders, mature saints, families, marriages you thought were strong, and you say, how in the world? I think that's how the devil works. He doesn't just attack in the place of weakness. He attacks in the place of strength. Abraham was the father of the faithful. He went down to Egypt, and the man of faith became a man of fear and started lying and saying his wife was just his sister. Moses is called the meekest, most gentle man on the face of the earth. But he allowed his anger to get the best of him, and he missed the promised land. Solomon is called the wisest man that ever lived. But you need to read the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon wrote that. And he said, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. This is a wise man that wasted his life because he started chasing women when he should have been chasing God. The, the enemy has a way of attacking in the place of your strength. This is why we need to be covering in prayer the spiritual leaders of the church. I need your prayers. The elders of this church need your prayers. The spiritual leaders of this church need your prayers. It's funny how we can come to church and critique what we don't like. Rather than praying for those whom God has placed the burden of leadership on. I was at a conference not too long ago. 
and I was meeting a lot of people, and they, is there a way I can contact you? Is there a way I can connect with you? Is there a way I can reach out to you? And I felt like everybody I met, I was giving my number out to, uh, asking this, that, and the other. And I bumped into a friend from Los Angeles who I had not seen in a good while, and I, I was so eager to see him, and in meeting up with Tyrone Skinner, he said, uh, HB, I, I don't have your new number. I need your number. I said, oh, Lord, not again. Somebody else uh, wants something from me. He, he, I gave him the number, but Tyrone Skinner has not asked me for anything. This ain't a part of my sermon. It became a part of my sermon on the way to Orange Park this morning. Because on the way to Orange Park, I got a text from Tyrone Skinner that I get every Sunday morning from Tyrone Skinner. It's a prayer for me as I get ready to preach and a prayer for you as you get ready to hear the word. Y'all ain't listening to me here. Two, two, two things about Tyrone Skinner. Y'all, first of all, y'all don't even know Tyrone Skinner. And he praying for you and praying for this service that you'll be built up in faith by the preaching of the word. Let me tell you something else about Tyrone Skinner. He got his own church. He got his own sermon. He got to preach this morning, but he taking time to pray for the leaders of this church that this congregation will be built up. Y'all not listening to what I'm saying. If people that don't even know this church are praying for the leaders, why can't we make a new commitment to cover all of our leaders in believing prayer. One more thing, and I'll get out your hair. Prayer warriors cover everything in prayer. Prayer warriors intercede for others. Quickly, finally. Prayer warriors focus on the advance of the gospel. Look at verse 19. I'm going to summarize these last two verses. Paul says, pray for me. But while you pray for me, let me make this note. Your praying for me is not really about me. Thank you for watching the broadcast. I hope it was helpful to you. If you're ever in the Jacksonville area, join us in person for worship at the Shiloh Church at either our downtown location or Orange Park location. For more information or resources, go to hvcharlesjr.com. For now, I hope you'll join us again next week and tell a friend. Thank you for joining us for today's broadcast of Cutting It Straight with Pastor H.B. Charles Jr., if you would like more resources from Pastor Charles or to support this ministry, he can be reached online at www.hbcharlesjr.com.